as we come together again, I'd like everybody, um, we're going to be seated. Um, this is a special, um, but we, I have the words up on the screen because I want everybody to have the opportunity to sing if they know the song because it's a really easy song to learn how to sing. Um, but before we do that, um, today's Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. But um, as you've probably noticed, that today's we've been seeing a lot about being a child of God and worshiping God as our Father. Um, so let's, I'm going to read Psalm 23 in the King James Version, um, just because it's so beautiful the way it is. Um, so, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I've been 
the goodness of God. Sing the chorus one more time. Kayla, that was beautiful. Well, junior church, you may be dismissed for class. Anybody want to be a kid today? All right. Praise the Lord. I was getting ready to run off with them. Well, are you glad to be here? I hope so. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to praise the Lord. Okay? Right? So get excited for the Lord. It's okay to do that. Don't let the title Baptist scare you and from being a little expressive in worship. Right? It's all good. So as you can see from the overhead there, the title of this morning's message is Ministering to One Another. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. Some of you are wondering what happened to Revelation. Well, I decided to end that series, and we'll come back to it another time. Um, just for things that are going on in the church right now, I felt that we needed to join together, unite together, and there's no better way of doing that than to understand the Scriptures and what they teach about all the different one another's that are in the Bible, and there's plenty of them. So I want to begin with a word of prayer. You can join me. Father, thank you. Thank you so much that we can gather together. I just pray that you will be glorified, that you'll help me to teach well, that you'll give everyone here ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand the truth of thy word. And we pray you'll be glorified in this time, and not only the time of just of hearing the word, but in the time of response to your word. Be glorified, and I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen? Well, just by way of introduction, when the Lord established the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, His church, the body, as recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, we see right away in this model of what the church looked like in Acts chapter 2, right away, there's a foundational principle that's being established. And that is, that the church is designed to meet a need, a very basic human need that is in every single person, and that is the need of fellowship, the need of relationship, the need of community. And we see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, be up on the overhead, reading in the ESV translation because I like the way it puts this ver these verses. So God's word says, so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So if I stop for a second, there was 120 followers of Christ up to this point. Peter preached the gospel, right? And at that point, the Holy Spirit fell upon those. They, were re they repented. They were baptized, it says, as it says right there. And then 3,000 souls were added to the church. Can you imagine that explosion? Of, of just of growth in one day, 3,000 people getting saved. And then look, look at their activity. I want you to see there in verse 42. And it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. There it is right there. To the breaking of bread and the prayers. So you see these four different things. There's teaching, 
right? And so we need to have teaching in the various times of our gathering. And then there's fellowship. Fellowship is such an important component of the health of a church. That's what we're missing, brothers and sisters, real biblical fellowship. And that's what I want to begin to talk to you about. And it says, the breaking of bread and prayers, and, and then awe, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many had need. And the reason why that is happening is because at the moment these Jewish people turned to Christianity, embraced Jesus Christ as the Messiah, they're, they're being kicked out of their families. They're losing their jobs. They're being persecuted for believing in this Jesus whom the Jewish community, for the most part, hated. Hated enough to what? Kill, right? And so they're embracing this Jesus. And so all of these new believers needed to join together. And so what do they do? They sold their possessions and things that they've owned and, and they laid it at the apostles' feet so that it would be distributed to those who had need. We have something similar to that today. We collect a, bene a benevolence fund where you can check off on your little envelope and give to the needs of the body because there are sometimes there are people who have needs and we want to be a blessing. So they did it this way. And it says, and, by, and day by day, attending the temple together, Notice the, the, the re repetitiveness of the word together. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What a wonderful picture of togetherness, community that was there in the beginning. And that's the church. The church is designed by the Lord to meet our need of community. You see, brothers and sisters and my friends, no one can survive in isolation. Nobody can survive in isolation. Sometimes people think, and they say to themselves, that they wish they had an island all to themselves, a beautiful island all to themselves. Well, there's a story, Robinson Crusoe tells us the opposite is true to that story, right? The story goes like this of an obstinate, Englishman who ignored his father's wish to become a member of the clergy, opting instead for life at the sea. No sooner had his career started that he suffered a shipwreck and was cast ashore alive, but alone somewhere on an uninhabited island off the coast of the New World. With only the supplies he savaged from the wreck of his ship, he managed to do some things. He, he built a house, a boat, and something of a life for himself. Listen to this. Despite living in a beautiful, ideal location, Crusoe was never truly happy in his setting. And he said this about his life. He said, I am cast upon a horrible, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. I am singled out and separated as it were, from all the world, to be miserable. I am divided from mankind, a, a solitaire, one banished from human society. And listen to these words. I have no soul to speak to or to relieve me. Well, listen, the reason for his unhappiness was his solitude. It wasn't the climate it was perfect. It wasn't the food. He had plenty of that. Or the setting that made him so desperately unhappy. Rather, it was the fact that he was alone. Singled out, he says, and separated, as it were, from all the world to be miserable. The island itself was not, hor not a horrible, desolate island. It became horrible because of Crusoe's unbearable solitude. He was all alone and lonely, right? The story of Robinson Crusoe reveals a basic human need that is in every one of us. All of us have it. And that is a need to have other people in our lives. 
real, genuine relationships. And this goes all the way back to creation. This is the reason why God created us. In the beginning, God created man in His image. And God looked at what He had made, and He gave a wonderful, beautiful creation. And every day after God created something, He said what? It is good. It is good. It is good. It wasn't only until He created man and placed the man on creation, then He said these words, It is not good that man be alone. I will fix for him a suitable helper. And so God created for the man a woman because it was not good that he would be in isolation. He created a woman so he would have a relationship. And listen to this. The world was perfect at that time. The world was sinless and the world was in perfect harmony with God yet. Listen. Humans still needed to be in community with other humans. Still needed other people. And so God created a woman. A woman to be a companion to the man and allow him to have true community. And though the world has changed since the entrance of sin, the need for community still remains. Amen? It still remains. And so if you study redemptive history you will come to see that the church is not something of an afterthought that came to God's mind later on. No. The church was the culmination of all of God's plans for His children. You see, the church, when it's done the right way, that God intends it for it to be, gives us just a taste, just a taste of a perfect community that we will all who know Jesus Christ, will experience someday in his paradise. And so as we gather next number of weeks, I'm not sure how many weeks I'm going to spend on this subject, but as we gather together and study the scriptures and learn how the Lord wants his body, the church, to live out in community here on earth, we're going to come, we're going to come across two phrases that basically mean the same thing. And those two phrases are this, each one and one another, each one and one another. As a matter of fact, over 50 different times in the New Testament is that phrase, one another, depending on how you uh, gather it together and count them, 50 different times. These one another passages are so important because they do not address our relationship with God nor do they, relate, do they address our relationship to ourselves. Nor do they address our relationship with the universal church. Rather, they address interpersonal relationships with the community of believers, the church. We won't be looking at all of them individually. A lot of them overlap each other. And they're, they're put together in maybe three to four different groups, and they're all basically saying much of the same thing that we're going to be studying in the weeks ahead. But they all reveal to us how we, as a church, can foster a community of gospel-centered relationships that glorify God. And not only glorify God, but allow the world to know and to see before their very eyes that we belong to Jesus. Amen? God wants the world to see that you and I belong to Jesus. And in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, God's word says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. There's one of the one another's. They're all over the Bible. So Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So how do we love one another? Just the way Jesus loved us. It's a lot to learn there, amen? A lot to learn there. That you also love one another. Why, Jesus? Why do you want us to have these kind of relationships that we're together and we're learning about each other? We're building relationships with each other. We're spending time together. We're investing our lives into other people's lives, and we know each other. We know what's going on in each other's lives. We know when someone's sick. We know when someone has has got some kind of pain going on in their life. We know. Why, Jesus? Why do you want us to live this way? 
Look at the next verse. By this, all, not just the church, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen? This is what the church is all about. And if we can't put these things, figure out how to put these things into practice, we're just wasting time. We're wasting time, brothers and sisters. We need to learn what it means to practice these one another's as a church. And so how do we foster? How do we cultivate this kind of culture here at Calvary Baptist Church? Because there's a culture. It's a way of living that, that one person or two people begin to do it. And then it begins to just kind of overflow into other people's lives. How do we do it? Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. There are three simple commandments here. Three simple commandments. They don't come out that clearly in the New King James. Other translations point them out for us. Let me read it to you, all right? And then I will... I will point out these commandments to you. You ready? Just nod your heads. We'll get done faster, guys. You glad you're here? All right. I haven't heard one person say amen. Let's practice it. Someone say amen. All right. There you go. Jeepers. You should try standing up here. Have you all you guys staring at me? Verse 24 of Hebrews 10 says, And let us consider one another... In, er, in order to stir up love and good works. There's the first commandment. Let us consider one another. Second commandment, verse 25. Not forsaking or let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner or the habit of some. But let us excuse me, exhort or encourage one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. You see the three commandments there? Let us consider one another. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And thirdly, let us encourage one another. You got it? All right, good. You're doing great. Unbelievable. So how do we foster this? Well, in order for us to understand these, three, these two verses here that we're looking at, we need to understand the context because you can't just take these two verses and kind of kind of go off on a little trail here and not understand where they're at. They're in a certain context. In other words, these two verses will never be able, the world will never be able to live these out the way God intends them to be. Nobody can. Only those who understand the context of what he's talking about. So the context there begins in verse 19 where he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He's using Old Testament terminology there, all right? And so Old Testament terminology, basically, he's trying to explain the gospel using Old Testament terminology. In verse 19, he's saying that you and I as believers, those who have turned from their sins and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, can have boldness, can have confidence to enter into the very presence of God. Isn't that a wonderful picture? For so many years, the Old Testament saints could not come into the presence of God. The Old Testament priest, one time a year, would come into a place called the most holy place. And he would there offer a sacrifice. And the blood of bulls and the blood of goats would offer up a sacrifice for the people one time a year. And there was a division between these two places in this tabernacle. The most holy place and the holy place. And so he's saying here to you and to me that Jesus, by his own body, through his own blood, right, made a way. He tore that divider between the most holy place and the holy place. And now there is direct access to the most holy place 
by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, if you're thinking, you're saying to yourself, how do I get the blood of Jesus so I can go into the most holy place? I know you're all wondering that, aren't you? Yeah, well, you just can't get it in the bowl or anything like that. It's kind of gross to think about it. So stop thinking about that, all right? But you do need the blood of Jesus to get into the most holy place. How do you get it? Well, you get it through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment you turn from your sins and you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood cleanses you of all your sins. You're forgiven, amen, I love it. You're forgiven of all your sins, and now you can have the confidence, the boldness, to walk into the very, not in the flipping, proud way, arrogant way, humble, of course, but you can come into the very presence of God. And that's what he talks about in the rest of those verses, in verse 22, that, that you can approach God in prayer anytime you want. You don't need a priest to talk to God. That's what he's talking about in these verses. So this is all talking about a vertical relationship that every person can have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You can have a vertical re this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because of what He's done for you and me. We can enter into the very presence of God. What a wonderful blessing that you and I have. Based on what Jesus Christ has done, you can enter into the very presence of God. Now listen now. I'm going somewhere with this. So based on this privilege that he's given to us to enter into the very presence of God, that you have a vertical relationship with God, he's saying believers now. Listen, every believer has responsibilities to each other now. You have responsibilities to each other, and that's what he's talking about in verse 24 and verse 25. You and I have responsibilities to each other. And so if we're honest, most of our Christian lives are focused on that vertical relationship. If you just think about all the time you spent, you're thinking about your relationship with the Lord, amen? And you ought to be thinking about that. You ought to be working on your relationship with God. It's very important. If you don't have a proper relationship with God vertically, you're never going to have a proper horizontal relationship with other people, amen? And so God doesn't want you to just focus on the vertical relationship. He also wants you to focus on the horizontal relationships that you have with each other. Amen? God wants us to work on these horizontal relationships, and we have a responsibility to work on those horizontal relationships. And so what is that responsibility? Well, the responsibilities is the title of the sermon that I gave to this, this talk that we're having. It is to minister to each other. We are to minister to each other. Now, when I mention, when a preacher mentions this word minister, it basically means service. It means, it could mean uh, servant, right? Same Greek word that is there. And it, it, and it can mean deacon, right? It's those, the same kinds of word, that we have the responsibility to serve and to minister to each other. When I mention that word, there's two groups of people in every church when the preacher mentions it, okay? Some people hear that word minister, and they think of this, that someone is going to minister to what? To them. I'm going to be ministered to, right? There's some of you who, are, who, who thought of that when I mentioned the word minister or ministry. You're saying, oh, I'm going to be ministered to. Now, there's some others here that when you heard the word ministry or minister, you're thinking, oh, I get to minister to somebody. Well, some of you are sitting there saying, oh, praise the Lord, someone's going to minister to me. Others are sitting there saying, oh, praise God, I get to minister. And I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. You're thinking of the, one of those terms. And if I had all the ones go on this side who were thinking that I get to minister to somebody, and then on, the, on this side, all those who are thinking that they get to be ministered to, we'll, we'll wonder what kind of church we have here, right? But listen. It shouldn't be both end or either or. Did I say that wrong? I think I did. It should be both end. It should be the same. When you hear that word ministry, you should be thinking the same thing, that you get to be ministered to. Why? So that you can minister to others. God wants you to be ministered to. Church should be that way, that you're sitting here, you're being ministered to. Amen? 
You're being fed God's word. Not so that you can just take it all in and feel pretty good about yourself, right? But God wants you to take in the ministry of God's word, to be strengthened in your faith, so that, what? You can minister to other people. And if you're just taking in the ministry, right, every Sunday, every Bible study, every time you hear a good message on the, on the radio or something like that, and you're just taking it all in, and you're not ministering to other people, you're lopsided, you're off-balanced, you're not operating the way God wants you to operate. He wants you to be ministering to other people. And what do you say? Amen. Come on, I want to hear it. Amen. Right? All right. Some of you were saying, oh, me. Not amen. It's a different, right? Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says this. As each one has received a gift. And that gift could be, uh, it could be the gift of salvation. But most likely he's talking about the spiritual gift. Everyone who has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God has blessed you with a spiritual gift, an ability to bless the body of Christ. So as each one has received the gift, he says, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So if you want to be a good steward, a good representation of why you are a Christian, if you want to represent the Lord here on earth properly, find out what your spiritual gift is and minister to other people with that gift. Amen? That's what God wants you and I to do. So how do we do this? How do we minister to each other? Or might I add, why? Why should we even bother? Well, in verse, in verse 24, he gives this first commandment. Listen to this first commandment. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. There are two words here, he says, that help us understand what this means. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The two words are consider and the other one is stir up. In other words, he's saying, think of a way, think of ways to motivate each other to acts of Love and acts of good works. Consider. The word consider means to focus your attention like a laser beam on a target. This means, brothers and sisters, that we ought to be planning, strategizing. We ought to be developing ideas on how we can foster a culture of community amongst ourselves. How can we live our lives so that we're not so focused on ourselves, but that we're focused on others. The Lord wants each of us, not just a few of us. He wants each of us to focus on how we can minister to one another. And so consider that. Consider how you can stir up one another toward love and good works. So what does the word stir up mean? This is telling us how we can focus our attention on each other. In other words, there is a point, there is a purpose to all of our fellowship. All of our relationships have a focus and have a purpose to them. There is a spiritual component to each of our relationships, and that is that we ought to consider one another in order to sp spur up or to stir up love and good works in each other's lives. We are to strategize concerning how we ought to spur each other on to love and good deeds. That word spur means to deliberately provoke. Now, some of you are good at that, provoking one another, right? And most of the time in the New Testament, that word to spur one another on, is provoke, is used in the negative sense. But here, like, like you were picking a fight with somebody, right? But here it is used in a positive sense. We are to find a strategy which will enable us to provoke one another to love each other more and to love God more and to do good works. Where to provoke each other so that we are loving God more and loving people more and serving in the community more. So the Lord wants us to minister to each other in such a way that our relationships are geared toward, toward helping each other 
to become more and more godly, helping one another to love God more, to love each other more, and to do good to others. And how can we do this? Well, I believe we can do this to our small groups. We have various small groups that meet during the week. We have Thursday night prayer meeting and our fellowship time. We have the women's Bible study. We have the men's Bible study. We have couples fellowship that is taking a break for the summertime. But these various small groups that we have should not be just to gather and to hear a teaching of God's Word. If that's all it's doing, it is missing the purpose of the fellowship that we ought to be having. In fact, I would challenge the leaders of all those groups, all those small groups, to even change the name of your gathering. When you hear the word study, some of you might be a little afraid to go to a study. Like, whoa, I don't feel that I know enough to go to a study. And maybe you feel a little apprehensive to going to a study. Maybe if we change it to men's fellowship or women's fellowship, couples fellowship. And so people understand that we're gathering together to share our burdens with each other, to share our struggles with each other, to, to, to pour my life into somebody else's life. Yes, we're going to study God's Word. We need to hear God's Word because God's Word strengthens us. But we need to pray together. And we need to be vulnerable and speak truth to one another's life. And that's what God wants us to do, amen? Now, obviously, this can become an annoying thing, right? When we gather together in those kinds of ways, because you've you got to go about it in the right way. You need to check your spirit when you're gathering together in that way and make sure you're not operating on the basis of, uh, uh, not, uh, not operating on a basis of law, but on grace, Right? Make sure you're not operating your life as a self-righteous person. Like you have a hard time admitting that you have faults. You, you always seem to have uh, your life is all together. And everybody sees that, uh, you know, you got it all together. That's a hard to approach a person like that, right? Well, that's a, that's a lie. You don't have it all together. You're, you're just like the rest of us. We're all struggling to become like Christ. We're all, we're all, we all should be vulnerable and real with each other and let each other know that, hey, I'm struggling to be godly. Do you know if you start sharing with that with other people, they're going to start sharing their struggles with you too? Amen? And if you all start sharing your struggles with one another and start praying together as brothers and sisters and carrying each other's burdens, as the New Testament says we ought to be doing, God will do a wonderful, wonderful work in this body. Amen? He'll do a wonderful work. Now, in verse 25, it has two commandments. I've got to go a little quick here now. Listen, two commandments. One's negative, and the other one's positive. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Let us not forsake. That's kind of a negative thing. It's not really negative, but it, it, it comes across negative. As the habit of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Well, the writer of Hebrews says that one of the reasons why we ought to be coming together on Sunday morning to worship the Lord is coming together to encourage each other. You and I ought to be challenged by the message. We ought to be inspired so that we can be filled with courage to minister to somebody else. That's why he says don't neglect it. Don't forget. Don't neglect or forsake the assembling of ours. Now listen, how in the world can we pour our lives and live out the community that God wants us to live and be the church that He wants us to be if we're forsaking the gathering together as a church? Now I'm not just talking about today. I'm talking about the different gatherings that, that a church offers to the body of Christ. If we are forsaking the gathering together, we are missing out on the opportunity to be the church that God wants us to be. Now, I'll be honest with you. This is one of the pastor's pet peeves, okay? Uh, it's, it's so discouraging to, to come to a Bible study and to look out and see empty seats. It's discouraging. It's only discouraging to me, but it's discouraging to the people who, who sacrifice their time to come so that they can gather together and be an encouragement to somebody else. And some have the attitude that, listen, if I come once or twice, twice you know, a month, that should be good enough. Well, that, that's a poor attitude to have, and that's discouraging. It's very discouraging. 
Well, the early church was, was struggling with this as well. And, and, and the early church was discouraged. And there were many, and he's saying this commandment to the early church. He says, stop forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. Now, you, you wouldn't picture that when we just read that, that picture of an, in Acts chapter 2 of this thriving church of 3,000 people added to it. And so he's saying to, to that church many years later, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Why is he saying that? Well, listen, uh, the early church was being persecuted. And so they were afraid to go and gather together because they were going to be persecuted. And so they would stay home. Well, that would cause discouragement in those who took the chance to go to that gathering and pray together and hear the word and have fellowship together because the other believers were afraid to come. Well, you and I don't have that problem. So what stops you, brothers and sisters? What stops you from coming to church? What stops you from being faithful to gather together with the rest of the church when, the, when we have our gatherings? What stops you? Do you have your kids in so many different extra activities that that is taking all of your time, that church becomes something that you add to your schedule? Well, that's fine, I guess. Well, let me just warn you what's going to happen. If you continue to do that, right, and make church something that you add on, your kids are going to catch that, by the way. Your kids are going to catch that, and don't be surprised one day if your kids do the same thing when they become adults and they see church isn't that important, uh, this, this sport activity is more important. And they stop going to church. Or this hanging out with this person is more important than going to... This is a terrible thing to teach young people, and we're doing it to them. Well, this last commandment is a commandment, believe it or not, after hearing that, to encourage one another. You and I have a ministry. Listen, you might not feel that you have many gifts of the Holy Spirit to offer to anybody, but every one of us can be an encourager. Every one of us can be. All you got to do is just come. You don't have to say a word. Just come and you're encouraging somebody. Amen? Just come and you're encouraging. But you can also encourage with your words. Now, the word encourage, I love this, means to inspire, to continue on a chosen course, to impart courage or boldness. In other words, you're in, you encourage someone when you take courage and you put it in them. You take courage and you put it in somebody else and all you got to do is just come to church. And sometimes you can use your words. Words are a wonderful way to encourage people. Now, some people have a hard time being an encourager, right? You might know someone like that. Well, there's a glass right here. Maybe, you know, maybe a little bit. I drank too much of it. Well, let's say you look at that glass and some say it's half empty. Some say it's half full. It's the same glass, right? And depending on how your outlook in life, you might be positive, it's half full. You might be negative, it's half empty, empty, right? And you focus on the emptiness, not on the fullness, amen? And so some people have a hard time being an encourager. Well, let me just tell you something. Encouragement is fundamental to the Christian faith. It's one of the reasons that we come together as a church to be an encourager. It's one of the most important spiritual gifts. We need encouragement. We need it because everybody... Maybe yourself is having a hard time. There's so much negativity and despair in this world. We need to be people that are encouraging other people. And some people, however, are so negative that they'll never be happy about anything. Perhaps you heard the story of the man who entered a very strict monastery. It was a Spartan place. Concrete floors, cold biscuits, the works. One of the rules was that the monks had to keep absolute silence. They were allowed to speak only two words every five years. So while this, this fellow entered and kept silent for five years, didn't speak a word, when the time for his review came up, his superior asked him for his two words. He said, food stinks. His superior blessed him and sent him back to his work. Five years later, his review came up again and the superior asked him for his two words. He said, bed's hard. 
superior blessed him and sent him, sent him along his way. Five, ye- five more years passed, and the superior again asked him for his two words, and he said, I quit. The superior said, that doesn't surprise me. You've done nothing but complain since you've been here. Well, we all know people like that, don't we? Basically, they're good people, but they just have a hard time. All they want to do is complain. You let them talk long enough, and they'll have something to complain about. Well, the Lord wants you and I to stop complaining and to be people to encourage. Listen, this morning's message is meant to encourage you, to let every one of us know that we have a purpose in life. You have a purpose in life. You have a ministry. Every single one of you have a ministry, a very important ministry, one that is meant to build up the church and to develop a culture of what the church should look like, a culture that sees Every one of us, each one of us, living out the together, the one another's of the Bible. So how can we begin to make this change here at Calvary Baptist? Well, I begin, I believe it begins by praying. Each one of us should be praying and asking the Lord, Lord, help me to minister to somebody. Put somebody in my life that I can minister to. Help me not to be just so focused on myself and me being ministered to, but give me eyes to see, to consider someone else. Someone else needs to be ministered to. Begin with prayer. Secondly, focus on others. Don't just focus on your own growth. Focus on the growth of somebody else. Thirdly, be faithful. Be faithful at coming together. Make missing church harder. Make missing church harder. Teach this to your kids. This will be so encouraging to you, and it will also be encouraging to others. Fourthly, think about what you say to people. Listen to what you say. Try to catch yourself when you get ready to say some kind of complaining thing in front of somebody, right? Matter of fact, the Bible says that, the Bible teaches that we ought to make, we ought, it's okay to complain, But guess who you should make your complaints to? To the complaint department. It's God. It's in heaven. Talk to him about it. All right? He'll straighten us out. He does it all the time. Right? And so try to catch yourself and do more encouraging than complaining. Mark Twain once said, I can live for a week off of one good compliment. I can live for a week off of one good compliment. William James, the father of modern psychology, said this. The deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. It's the craving to be appreciated. And George Matthew Adams said this, encouragement is the oxygen of the soul. That's a good word there. You want to fill somebody up with hope? Encourage them. It's the oxygen of the soul. Well, I pray that you'll begin a journey together, all of us, of becoming all that Christ wants us to become, His body here on earth, to live out His life among each other. I heard of a story of a a church in San Diego. I believe it's called Christ Church. It's a statue in front of that church of Jesus. And it's a beautiful statue, which someday, someday, some people came along and vandalized it and broke the hands off of the statue of Jesus. Oh, Everybody in the church was, was just, man, they were just hurt by it. The pastor got clever, and he put a sign in front of that statue, and it said this, where are the hands of Jesus? And the sign said, you are the hands of Jesus. May that become a reality in all of our lives. We are the hands of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, I come to you. And I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord God, that you would have your way in all of our hearts, that we would become the church you want us to be, a church of one another's, that you would help build a culture of community, build up relationships in this church, that we would not just think of ourselves, 
but we would think of one another. That we would consider how we can stir up one another toward love and good works. Help us to flush that out in a series of messages, Lord, that will help us to put some feet to that. That the world will know that Calvary Baptist belongs to you. That we are your hands, we are your feet. So help us, Lord. 